We're going to get going a couple of minutes early because I've got a, an important public service announcement. Um, Last year we received a, a, a note from a, an attendee, sorry, a human. Um, this was my first DEF CON and I, I really enjoyed the conference, but I found all this swearing very upsetting. I think this lowers the quality of the conference and truly offends many people. Andy. Well, Andy, um, I want you to know that we take this very seriously at DEF CON and therefore the uh, following phrases are now banned. Fuck, fuck you, fuck off. What the fuck is your problem? No, I do not know who the fuck you are. What the fuck and fuck you, you fucking fucks. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, for bringing this to our attention. Uh, oh, one last thing. We are the speaker goons. We're the guys that get these drunk people up here to speak to you. Um, we have a, our, uh, our motto is AMF yo-yo because when the speakers give us a problem, we say adios, motherfucker, you're on your own. We are of course looking for a replacement phrase now because we can't use that one anymore. So if you have any ideas, bring them over to the speaker room. We have another tradition here at DEF CON. Uh, uh, both uh, Tim and Ryan are new speakers. They've never spoken at DEF CON before. So if I could get some help up here. Grab a cup, gentlemen, grab a cup. That's not what she's. <laughs> so those three are mine, right? Where's it? Here, take that. Give that. Get that to him. <laughs> Gee, you know, more and more people keep coming out for this tradition. <laughs> Cheers. What? He doesn't have one. You don't have one. Take one. All right. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. Have a good talk. Congratulations and many speaking opportunities. So for the, those of you that don't know me, my name is Ryan Smith and uh, this is Tim Shraziri. We are both security engineers at Lookout. At Lookout. <laughs> Lookout provides mobile security for both iPhone and Android and we have about 45 million users around the world on which we get to see security events and help protect them. Um, so with this we see a lot of trends. We also have another uh, acquisition system where we're able to acquire all, all, essentially all the Android applications that are in propagation and distrib distribution around the world. Um, so with this we see a couple of trends. Um, when you have millions of applications it's very difficult to, to track each individual um, set of applications and one of the trends that we've seen is Russian SMS fraud. Uh, SMS fraud is something that's not new. We've been tracking it for about three years. Uh, but over the last three years we've seen two trends. One is a rise in sophistication of the code, uh, more obfuscation, more attempts to, to evade detection and also um, a large, a very steep increase in volume. Um, so those trends uh, have led us to this talk called Dragon Lady. The title of Dragon Lady comes from uh, the, the code name for the U2 aerial reconnaissance vehicle that was used to uh, observe Soviet activities uh, during the Cold War through adverse conditions, through weather, and their motto was, in God we trust, all others we monitor. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>, so, <laughs> so uh, who are we? So my name is Ryan Smith. I'm a sec senior security researcher at Lookout. Um, I've been a member of the HoneyNet project for the past ten years where I've learned uh, a lot of skills and I stand on the shoulder of many giants within the org organization. Um, and I previously worked on x86 reverse engineering, so automated shell code unpacking and uh, malware sandboxing. Um, previously I've spoken at AppSec and uh, IEEE Hicks and as you guys all know, this is my first time at DEF CON. Um, so Tim Shazir, I'm going to hand the talk off for him for now but uh, another note, this is Tim's birthday today so if you see this guy around. Feel free to give him as many shots as you like. 
Thanks for uh, throwing me under the bus, Ryan. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Tim Strazeri. Uh, you can just call me Diff. I'm the different Tim at work for many different reasons. Um, so just call me Diff, whatever. When we're going to drink at the bar, I'll buy you guys a shot if you buy me a shot. Like everyone, that, that goes out to everyone. Um, so I'm the lead research and response engineer uh, at Lookout. Basically, we get to take apart malware all the time. It's basically a dream job. If you guys are interested, come talk to me afterwards. We'll hook you up with a dream job. Um, I'm kind of known for the Android market and bashing my head against the wall and trying to figure that out for a very long time. Um, I'm also probably the jerk who's responded to you on mailing lists if you ever ask questions about this. Uh, I'm a big junkie for reversing mobile malware. If you guys haven't looked into it, I suggest this to everyone I meet. It's really interesting because not only like when people are engineering applications for mobile, uh, they have to worry about battery, um, is the connectivity dropping. It's really interesting from a mobile malware perspective of, you know, you're trying to create, someone out there is trying to create a botnet and also try and um, like work through those ebb and flows of is the network down, uh, where is this person that I've infected, and it ends up being really interesting twists to the problem of malware. Um, and I've spoken at previous places uh, mainly about anti-analysis, decompilation, and emulation. So why are you here and why do you care about what we're talking about? Um, the deep dive, we really wanted to go and do this case study about uh, Russian malware because you see lots of headlines out there and they're really misleading or they're interesting because there's numbers and percentages but percentages lie. Um, you know, if there's an increase of things, like just giving a percentage of saying like it increased a thousand percent, what does that even mean? Does that mean you went from like zero samples to having ten samples or something like that? Um, so we wanted to quantify and actually dig down and say like what is the difference? We're not just basing this off of total numbers of files that we see. Um, another thing is when you look at samples in the wild, um, AV companies usually distinguish samples by there's a hash. So when a unique file comes across the table, they say we have a new sample. But when you look into the code of those, sometimes there's absolutely no difference in the actual file. So, you know, if you're just going to go out there and grab 10,000 samples, but they do exactly the same thing, there's really no differences except for maybe a few modified flags. It kind of makes you, let, lets you boost up your number if you want to, but it doesn't really help you solve the problem at hand or actually understand the problem. Um, and then another reason was uh, we see a lot of things coming out of Russia and everyone just says it's Russian toll fraud and it's called fake installer and they kind of just throw everything into it and it's like, well, it sends SMS, therefore it's the same thing. It's not true once you start digging into the actual technicality of it. So as I said, um, a new hash is not always a new sample. And this was an example I just pulled up um, from what we call alpha SMS. And I had three APK files, which is essentially a zip file. Um, and you get the, the SHA-1 sum of those. The SHA-1 sum ends up being something different. So a lot of people at this point might say, I have three different samples and these are three different infections and now I have three things instead of one. But once you start pulling these apart, you end up seeing the classes.dex, which is essentially where all that code um, lays for an Android application. They're all exactly the same. And uh, Ryan will go into depth on this, but basically, if I pull this open in a hex editor and I'm looking at a zip template, as you can see, the actual times of when these were packaged are different. And that's the only difference that you hear. There's also a configuration file for when the affiliates were going through. Um, so different affiliates have different affiliate configurations, but the code is actually identical. So these samples are exactly identical. Um, they just belong to different affiliates. So that's interesting in its own case, but uh, you, you need to understand this difference instead of just saying I have three different pieces of malware here. Um, the the f basic ma uh, families that we went through were uh, we ended up breaking up the Russian malware into alpha SMS. Um, bad news, which is actually a recent one we just blogged about. This one was specifically interesting because it was basically around um, the, uh, it was an ad SDK that these malware authors were uh, attempting to get developers to use inside their applications. Then we also have Connect SMS, Deposit Mobi, Fake Browse, SMS Actor. We also have uh, at the bottom, this is not a toll fraud, but it is a Russian malware, not compatible, which I'll touch upon a little bit later. As you can see, they all send SMS except for the bottom, um, but they do have other features sometimes in there, like downloading applications, trying to install those applications, or suggesting that a user install that application. Um, a lot of them exfiltrate uh, personally identifiable information, so that's stealing your contacts um, or uh, attempting to look at your web browser history. Uh, and then it was also interesting to notice that some of these people were using obfuscation. 
it was all off, uh, not off the shelf obfuscation. So it was all this custom made stuff that we're seeing. And you can actually see that between the different groups, they started sharing obfuscation techniques. Um, and we thought this was important because, as you see, lots of people just say all those different families that have different feature sets and they also have um, different ways of uh, infecting people and uh, different feature sets. Basically, a lot of people just say, well, it's Russian SMS. Who cares? Like, let's just group it all into one. And you kind of miss the big picture of who's doing this and what they're actually attempting to go for. So as we were going through, um, just specifically I was looking at Connect SMS and I went through our archives of samples and I pulled randomly, I pulled a sample from A, F, P, and S. And so these are all diff different variants of the same family. Uh, and it ended up looking pretty interesting. You can see the package by date, um, when these were actually created by the malware author. Uh, and then the first instance actually just had no obfuscation in there. It was really simple. Basically you open up this application and it just sends an SMS and that's all. There was uh, debug information in there which ended up being kind of interesting because this means they didn't run ProGuard, they didn't run DexGuard and they just had all this extra metadata sitting there in their application. Um, later on in F we actually saw this is uh, it was packaged a few months, months afterwards. Um, they started adding more SMS endpoints. They actually extracted that into a configuration file. So it wasn't just sending hard coded SMS um, and it actually had all the uh, SMS endpoints and the URLs started becoming uh, encrypted in that external file. Um, they also added contact exfiltration which was interesting because they weren't actually spamming your contacts but they're sending that off to a third party server. So it was just an interesting um, way to see this, this sample evolve. Uh, later down the road we still see the SMS endpoints and the URLs encrypted which was actually being used, uh, the same cryptography was being used. They um, added more obfuscation at this time. So if you just looked at the two samples next to each other without digging down deep, you might say, this is brand new code. But you know, you deobfuscate that. Wait, they're using the same cryptography? Okay, they're even using the same keys? That's, that ends up being an interesting correlation to draw. Um, in the actual P sample, they removed the contact exfiltration. So it's interesting to see that these guys are attempting to evolve. Maybe they decided we're going to steal all of everyone's contacts. Maybe we're going to spam it. Maybe they tried that technique um, and it didn't actually work out so they ended up removing it. Maybe they saw like a correlation of people are downloading less things because they added more permissions. Um, and then in the last sample that we saw, and this one is actually pretty recent, um, they've actually moved the SMS and URL endpoints. They're still encrypted but they're not actually kept inside the package. So what they're doing is they're actually contacting the URL and dynamically retrieving that information. So no, now you no longer have actual static configurations in the application. Um, so another interesting point when we were going through that obfuscation, and here's a ex little example, this is actually from Alpha SMS. Um, these people were building uh, custom obfuscation tools. And essentially, if you know what Java code looks like, this is Smiley, which is a reverse engineered, uh, basically taking the Dalvik byte code and putting it into human readable format. Uh, this is basically a Java reflection call, and they're decrypting the string, which just looks like garbage essentially. Um, and then they're using that decrypted string to reflectively instantiate uh, some function methods. So I believe this is actually the start of a, uh, a send message uh, function. Um, and it's, it ends up being really interesting because when they're running these tools against all their samples, uh, almost weekly they were changing their obfuscation methods. The patterns were essentially the same, but you couldn't actually look for the same encrypted sequences or the same, um, the same exact pattern. It was very similar but once you start deobfuscating all these, the samples end up aligning again and you see that code similarity coming back out. Um, a lot of people have looked at this and said that, oh, okay, it's, it's polymorphism, they're just trying to change it all the time. Uh, it, it ends up not being as scary once you understand what's actually going on. Uh, but it, it is interesting to see that different organizations tend to start sharing this uh, obfuscation technique and you actually see them uh, distributing malware that's using the same techniques but then different seeds into that actual obfuscation. Um, one of the really interesting trends, we sat down with our data team and we were looking at detection data. And uh, this is just a, a quick cross section of one specific family. This one, I believe, was uh, Connect SMS. And this is a, a little old for the data, but it, it does illustrate the point that um, each different color is a specific uh, a variant that was getting pushed out. Uh, so essentially, what we saw is that there were different package names getting pushed out every single week. And once you uh, 
read through the noise, what was actually happening is these guys were essentially operating as like a startup with like an agile type of methodology. So as you can see, almost this, this ends up mapping out to be seven days. So for seven days, they're going to be pushing the same exact piece of malware to thousands of devices. And they keep just trying to jam it down the throat using spam techniques um, or getting uh, infected hosts to serve this up, like infected websites. And what happens is almost right on midnight in Russian standard time, which that's not actual standard time, but Russian time. <laughs> So basically at midnight they switch over and they just stop pushing that old piece of malware and they start pushing a new one. So they're, they're incrementally pushing updates. So this is basically uh, you know, Russian malware startup 101 which ends up being really interesting. So uh, wh while we were going through this we actually came across not compatible. This isn't actually uh, SMS fraud but it is another interesting way to see how this uh, mobile malware in Russia specifically is being uh, compartmentalized and actually commoditized. Uh, th this was an interesting one essentially because if you look at the diagram at the bottom, they're infecting devices and essentially using, you know, people inside the US, people in different countries as proxies to hide their traffic. Uh, and you might think like, well, well, who cares? Like, what are they actually using this for? Uh, it, it looked like what they were doing was they seemed to be buying up swaths of compromised accounts or uh, compromised websites luring victims in through there, actually getting the uh, devices infected. And now once you have someone in the US, maybe they're starting to sell these services and actually let other people um, use that proxy connection. So what this looks like it's going to be doing, and we've actually observed traffic of them purchasing uh, tickets online. So this, this most likely is to evade actual fraud detection systems so that, you know, when you see someone from Romania buying Justin Bieber tickets for LA, that probably triggers a flag and you're like, well, why is that, Rom I mean, everyone loves Justin Bieber, but Romania, I don't know. But, like, it's a pretty long flight. So they're actually going to go through and they're going to take a device that's infected in LA and then they're going to just proxy their traffic through there. They buy that ticket most likely with a stolen credit card. They then have a mule pick it up. Maybe they sell that. They do something with that ticket, but basically they're allowed to get around that fraud detection system because they look like they're actually an endpoint that is a viable endpoint for purchasing that type of work. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back over to Ryan, which please buy him some drinks too. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. So I'll, I'll step back for a second. So just to summarize, when we had this large amount, so these, these Russian SMS fraud organizations we noticed were accounting for 30% of our overall detections worldwide. So that's a huge number. Um, and, and it's a huge number of samples of malware to look at. So when we look at classifying them and do the de doing the deep analysis like Tim said, it's important to not just call them all, oh, this sends an SMS, so I'll call it SMS send. Um, but really categorize it by individuals because they evolve differently. Uh, different actors act differently. And once we started dividing them differently, we noticed certain particular actors evolving different than the others. And they appeared to be distributing at higher and higher rates. Um, and so this led us to find these SMS fraud, um, basically cottage industries, uh, where there's an entire industry built around SMS fraud, and the entire distribution channel has been commoditized, where everybody's getting paid to do their little piece of the pie, and they specialize in that specific thing, maybe distributing uh, or creating fake websites with with realistic-looking uh, skins or themes or some people specializing in social media distribution through Twitter or Facebook or things like that. Um, but each person specializing in one thing or another. And that has led to these top ten organizations that we've identified uh, accounting for over 30 percent of the overall detections. Uh, and that's quite um, significant. So this is DEF CON after all. So this is an investigation of Russian SMS fraud. But it could also be called if you happen to find yourself in the Moscow International Transit Area, saving up for a permanent vacation in a South American country, which we all know there's other outs. Um, here's how you might find some extra cash. Um, <laughs> but please don't. I'm not advocating that. Um, so, so you might go to a chat room like this. There's plenty of chat rooms or forums rather in, in Russia that are specialized in, in what they call black hat SEO or web monetization. Um, some more gray than others. Um, there's lots of ways to monetize in, in Russia as I'm sure you guys are well aware. And so this one you might be searching for Android WAP. WAP is the wireless application protocol and that's basically what Russians call the data channel over a cellular network. So anything that has to deal with mobile data, 
they call WAP. So these, these systems are typically called WAP click or WAP this, WAP that. Um, so you find one and it says that uh, it has unique landing pages and it's the best of the best. So you click on that and it tells you a few things. It tells you they pay out every Thursday. It says that they will help you. They have the best successful landing pages. Um, they'll create, they'll help you distribute. And essentially what this is, is this is an advertisement for an affiliate system uh, where you can sign up and if you have mobile traffic, you can sign up and they will help you distribute these Android malware that they'll custom package for you and deliver to your victims transparent to you. So you just set up websites, you drive traffic, you get money. And uh, to see how easy that is, I don't know if this video will play, but yeah. So they make it seem like child's play. Like you sitting out on the beach, riding on top of mobile phones, <laughs> coins dropping out of the sky. <laughs> you have to do a little work, but we'll take care of the rest. And that's essentially what these organizations are. They take care of the technical parts, they take care of the, 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 the campaign running and things like that. And you just have to deal with building out websites and making money. Um, so we have a, a life cycle. I'll go around it piece by piece. So individually I'll talk about the, the HQ organizations is what we, we're calling them but there's basically these affiliate marketing headquarters. These are the guys that say we'll take care of building Android malware for you. We'll c take care of helping you run a successful campaign. We'll tell you which campaigns are more successful. Um, so some of the themes that they look like and I'll show you this later, they look like Opera, they look like Skype, um, they look like ICQ or Flash. So they'll tell you which ones work in, in which countries and in which markets. Um, and they'll take care of all that for you. They also take care of one of the things that that post said um, in, the, in the forum is that they also have good relationships with the billing companies, with these SMS fraud billing companies. So for those of the, you that don't know, I'm not sure if there's people in the room that don't know, but uh, SMS fraud is essentially you download an Android application and as soon as it fires up, as soon as you, you launch the application, it sends off three text messages. It, it can send off any number of text messages but in most cases it's three individual text messages usually distributed among, among different numbers so that if one doesn't succeed the others might. And then they get a response back and say I've sent the messages and typically it'll either close down or maybe they give you a, a coupon or a link or something but not, not what you were anticipating on, on downloading. Um, so these, these organizations, they have the business relationships with the SMS registrars and that's, that's, a, that's what they provide. They, so they handle the business and the back end and the technical side of, of building out the Android applications. And I'll, I'll walk through what some of that looks like in just a second. So what these organizations look like if you went to their sites, some of them look like fairly legitimate businesses. Now this one looks like it's maybe from the 1980s so you'd be a little bit skeptical. Um, but some of them are a little bit flashier, they're more HTML5, you know, something that you'd be more comfortable with. Um, some of them have like a nice milkman look to them. Um, but some of them don't. Not all of them do. <laughs> so some guys don't try to hide what they're doing. Uh, but because of that, so these other organizations that I showed you that appear to look squeaky clean, uh, they have open registration. So anybody can sign up with a, with a web money account and an ICQ number and, and uh, email address. Now these guys are a little bit more skeptical. They want to talk to you like on ICQ. They want to know how much traffic you have. Because they do, so what Diff was talking about earlier, not all SMS malware is made equal. These guys actually do a lot of PII theft and they'll run botnet commands through your, uh, through the infection. So they do a lot more um, than what the other guys do and, and their look uh, should show that. Um, so what they also do is they, they try to promote uh, affiliate distribution. So they promote whoever is the top affiliates. They try to encourage you to uh, distribute more. And they have, all of them have top 20. Um, so they'll, they'll have like a listing of who their top affiliates. This, these have badges of honor um, if you're top affiliates. And they show you rankings like how, how many places you've moved up and down. Um, and here's another one that looks uh, quite similar. Here you get the big chair if you, you want. It's a little classier. Um, and this is one of the top, uh, those, those two are, are the top uh, distributors uh, as far as the, the HQ organizations as a whole. Um, and some of the other things that they do, we saw that they, they run quarterly competitions also on top of the regular rates. And, and again, if you're a top affiliate, most times you get additional payout. So the percentage will increase as you bump up to the top once you become a top affiliate because they don't want to lose you. Um, and so some of the other things that they do is run quarterly competitions. So they have a summer competition that we just saw an announcement for that was they were advertising 300,000 US dollars in prize and caches, uh, caches, cash and prizes. 
Um, so it's, it's a significant amounts of money. Um, and individual affiliates we've seen have made up to $12, so $12,000 per month uh, sustained over multiple months. So this is a fairly significant uh, industry for, for both the affiliates and these HQ organizations. And so I mentioned before affiliates can leave if they want to. They're not tied to one of these dis uh, distributor HQ organizations. So they also provide news feeds. They also provide customer service. And some of the top affiliates actually go out and, and force rank these, these websites in like customer service, payout, timeliness, and things like that. So, so they, they operate like Diff said as a startup. And they're pushing out new code and new features every two weeks because they want to keep their affiliates happy and engaged. So as an affiliate you would come along and you could use these tools that they've built and with almost no technical knowledge, no, no knowledge of how to build an Android application, you could go through a step by step process of building one of them for you. And I'll go through that step by step process with you right now. You name your campaign, so you can set up campaign A and campaign B, and you can test one on one set of websites and then one on another set of websites, and you can see which one does better. Because these guys take it seriously like a business and they want to see which, uh, which of their investments are doing the best. Um, so, second, you choose your targets. So, this site provides Android, iOS, and Symbian support. So, Symbian and iOS are, are very basic, whereas Android is, is very clearly the key target. So then you pick a theme. So here these, these guys have maybe 50 different themes that you can choose from. You have your typical uh, porn and porn videos and then you have MP3s, free MP3s, those always do well. But lately there's been a rise in things like Adobe Flash, you know, the, the pop-ups that say update your Flash or download the no newest version of Skype or download Opera. Um, so you can choose the theme and here th this site even gives you a pop-up that will tell you what the effectiveness of that theme is. So they'll tell you what the payout has been, what the success, the conversion ratio has been, in what countries is it most successful, how is it best distributed, and they give you all sorts of tips so that you can pick out the best theme for your market. Once you have that, they essentially give you copy and paste code. You take some JavaScript, you put it into your landing page, you build out some websites, and the JavaScript will automatically redirect your users to their download page. Uh, because these are custom built Android applications, they don't just build them and give the code out give the, the APKs out. Uh, they build everything dynamically. So they redirect all the traffic back to them, to these headquarters organizations. And when the users or the victims come along, they download and they, they custom compile things. And like Diff said, that's what leads to a lot of this uh, individual hashes. So you see different hashes. But that's because every victim that comes along is getting a unique version even though the entire, the code is the same, the time stamps are, stamps are going to be different and maybe the theme is going to be different because everything is extremely customizable in these applications. These guys don't waste uh, any time hard coding the information in there. So all the SMS registration information, all the themes, everything is, is custom configurable and, and templated. So once you have these sites, ha once you have the, the Android campaign built out, you need to distribute it. And so you need to build convincing sites, you need to register convincing domain names, and you need to lure in some traffic. And this is where the affiliates really go to work. These, these are the sort of the foot soldiers of these HQ organizations. So they put them out, put them to work, going out and registering these little accounts. That way if they use any bad tactics that happen to work, like spamming, they can say, well, we told them not to spam and you can just shut down those domains. But uh, the big domain and all the other affiliates are safe. Um, so the individual affiliates will build out, build out pages. Some of the pages we've seen look like this. So this one's SEO optimized to look like a search query for Opera. So you might search in, in Google and then be redirected to a page like this to download Opera. And then when you click anywhere on here, you would be redirected to what looks like an Opera download page. Um, and once you downloaded that, that would install on your phone and you'd be charged money. Uh, one of the other popular scams is Google Pay Play. Uh, obviously this doesn't look exactly like Google Play, it's called Android Play, uh, but it's fairly convincing and uh, generates a lot of revenue for these guys also. And then if you want to download the Google Play uh, market, you can do that. And again, this looks convincing. The domain is even convincing. And uh, that's how these guys generate the traffic to then push people to download uh, these applications. And then they're getting anywhere between three and eighteen dollars per download and install. So once you've built out your websites as an affiliate, you need to drive traffic. 
to those sites. So some of the ways that we've seen is through social media. Twitter happens to be a, a common uh, theme that's used by these guys. Uh, another common theme that we've seen is in the Russian uh, network specifically. They've started building rogue ad networks. So Diff mentioned bad news. This was an ad network that was built expressed with the expressed intent of pushing malicious links to these SMS, uh, uh, SMS fraud applications. And so when a user would, would buy some sort of game application, they would see a pop-up ad and it would say, you know, urgent, you need to update your Skype, it's out of date. And when they would click on it, they would download one of these, they would be redirected to one of these pages and uh, download a, uh, an application that would charge them anywhere between three and, and eighteen dollars and then not give them Skype. Um, so what do some of these Twitter accounts look like? Uh, we found over 50,000 uh, Twitter accounts uh, that were distributing uh, spam type messages linking back to these Russian uh, advertising networks. Some of them were more obvious than others. Uh, this guy was, I think, uh, he was tweeting out links to only the same domain and then just changing the page. So that was a bit obvious. Also he, s he was sending out tweets three in one minute. So he was very bursty and he was very greedy. And you can see he sent out 3,600 tweets in, in a very short amount of time and it may be like six months. But you can notice he doesn't have very many followers and he's not following that many people. So um, that's a lot of tweets for a guy with no friends. So some like I said are not as obvious. The only thing obvious here is that this guy has the default profile picture. So a lot of the Twitter accounts because they're being bought up in blocks of like 10,000 Twitter accounts, uh, they won't bother to, to customize the def to, the, de sorry, to customize the, the profile picture. So they'll leave the default profi profile picture up there. And uh, that's usually a, a fairly good indicator uh, that they may be up to no good but not necessarily uh, the only indicator. Uh, so this guy you can see is more distributed. He's even retweeting. He's talking about lawyersonline.ru, um, legitimate traffic. So he's interspersing normal conversations with his malware and so he's trying to evade a little bit uh, more cleverly. Um, but, and he's only sending 130 tweets um, with only one follower. Um, so he was caught because he was related to somebody else who was not so uh, quiet. Um, so next, Again, once, once you've built out this traffic, you've, you've sent people through Twitter um, back to these um, landing pages. Uh, the vi from the victim's perspective, you know, they would go click one of the advertisements, they would click on one of the Twitter links, um, then they would go to the web page, the landing page, they would download the application and it would look like this. So you see Google Play in the bottom left. That doesn't really stand out as, as uh, suspicious. And that's basically the only thing that's real about the application. So you open it up and at the top, so I'll, I'll do some quasi translation for you. At the top it's saying that this is important update. Um, and then it says that it's the new version of Android market. And then down at the, the second it says that it's installing. And then here it says that it's installed and please click run. And then the bottom button says run. Um, if you notice there is some fine print on the bottom. I don't know how many people actually read it but in this case it's kind of important because it tells you how much they're going to charge you. Um, but again, once, when you downloaded it, there was nothing telling you that they were going to charge you. So if you notice from these landing pages, in order to comply with, with what these affiliate HQ organizations say, they say their, their policy is you can't tell somebody that it's free, but you also don't have to tell them that they're going to be charged for it. Just putting this terms of service terms of service somewhere in the application is good enough. Uh, and so in this case there was a link at the bottom. Maybe that's caveat emptor. You should have known. But uh, in other cases it's not as obvious. So in this, I don't know if you can tell but there's no links. Um, and all it says is if you're ready, click here to go to the next screen. And uh, if you look in the code, you would see that there's a lot of breaks. There's a lot of new lines. And they've essentially pushed the terms of service so far down, it's down there at the bottom, that you would have to scroll down for about two minutes before you ever get to the terms of service. <laughs> but technically it's there. So again, instantly, once you've downloaded these applications, the only reason that that install bar is up there, which by the way is just a JavaScript loop, it's not actually tied to any progress. Um, the only progress that it may be tied to is ensuring that they have enough time to send out the three text messages before the application closes. 
Um, so the money goes directly out to the carriers. Um, in some cases you have some time to negotiate with the carriers and say hey that's not, uh, that wasn't a charge that I was expecting. And depending on the carrier and depending on which country you're in, these uh, windows of time that you have to dispute vary. So in the, in the US it's 60 uh, days, up to 60 days, but in other countries it's, it's very s slim and maybe potentially none. Some, in some cases it may go directly into uh, their accounts. And so once the money goes into the accounts of the SMS registration, uh, the HQ organizations will take that money out and distribute it to the individual affiliates that were responsible for generating those downloads. And they have ways of tracking individual downloads that they're rewarding the right peoples. Um, and so again here, here's evidence of, of how much uh, one person can make in a month. And in this one case, this is just a one month, could be a one off, but he made 600,000 rubles which is roughly equivalent to 20,000 US dollars in one month. So you could save up for a pretty good vacation. Um, so some conclusions. So we found 10 Russian SMS fraud sites that accounted for over 30% of the worldwide malware detections. As Diff pointed out and I think I've, I've kind of pointed out also, uh, the number of these detections can be often inflated. Uh, so in some cases we see over 100,000 unique samples but when we classify them the way that we do we can condense them down into only 100 variants of the same malware so reduce it you know significantly um, and track exactly what they're doing and by classifying it this way we've been able to follow these individual malware that's being distributed up through the distribution channels through the affiliates and some may people may have stopped there. So sometimes you might say, hey, we know where these download links are coming from. We can just shut down those domains for these landing pages. But then you'd be spending your time in the whack-a-mole game because you'd be knocking down one affiliate and another one would pop up. And then you'd knock down another affiliate and another one would pop up. But by seeing all the way back to the headquarter organizations, you can see the entire picture and uh, step out of the, the whack-a-mole game a bit and see where the key uh, linchpin pieces are. Um, and so SMS fraud is a very diverse threat, requires ca careful categoriz categorization. Just because it sends an SMS uh, does not make it the same as, as Dip pointed out. Some uh, applications will try to steal more data um, and try to do more uh, harm than just SMS fraud. Um, and we've seen commoditization. So here we're seeing commoditization similar to how we've seen PC crimeware um, happening in Russia. And this is the first uh, big instance of, of commoditization in an actual industry around mobile malware. And so that's a significant development that this isn't just one guy b developing software, but it's one guy developing software, selling it to a larger organization who has connections to SMS registrars and have maybe thousands of affiliates distributing the malware for them. Um, and then those affiliates have people building websites for them and generating uh, social media traffic for them. And so there's a fairly large and broad industry involved in the distribution of these, these very few organizations malware. Um, and so I'll let Diff come up and uh, thank a few people but uh, I, I'd like to thank the entire R and R and security team at Lookout. There's a lot of people in the background that did a lot of work here. Diff and I are just the, the people that are lucky enough to be standing up in front of you. But uh, certainly there's a lot of others doing a lot of hard work on our team at Lookout. I'd like to also thank the HoneyNet project. There's a lot of people in that organization that I've stood on the shoulders of and certainly learned a lot, especially in this type of investigation. And then Diff. Uh, a lot of the samples that we actually went through and uh, we submit a lot of samples to uh, Mila, which thank you to Mila for running the Contagio mini malware dump. Um, if you ever want to have some fun things to look at for reverse engineering, she also has lots of uh, crime work kits up there. Um, but there's lots of uh, actual mobile malware. Um, if there's any other specific samples that aren't up there, feel free to reach out to us. We're always in the mood for sharing and trying to, you know, make new friends and share techniques and whatnot. Um, also, just for uh, Android reversing in general, you should follow a lot of these guys. These are all their Twitter handles. Uh, J Duck does some really interesting stuff. Puff and uh, Thomas Cannon from Via Forensics. Really, really smart guys. Um, Anthony Desnos, he's the creator of AndroGuard. Um, a really interesting guy, uh, OSX Reverser, that's Fractal G. Uh, he's a guy based out of Portugal. You should really follow him. He does some really interesting stuff based around the economics of malware and rootkits. He's the one who's always making fun of Hack Team 
for uh, crisis and whatnot. So he, he, uh, he's showing people how to make better root kits and uh, he's done some really interesting stuff and like I said, it's a really interesting perspective looking at the economics of malware and what the return of, on investment is for all that. Um, other than that, uh, Justin Case and Gunther and uh, Crypto Girl from Fortinet, really great people to follow and you'll be able to stay up to date on the most uh, really interesting Android malware and um, just the rooting scene in general. Um, and then if you'd like to see more information, we actually post it on our blog. Uh, so blog.lookout.com. There's a, uh, it's about like a 10 page, almost like a white paper and it has a lot more technical details uh, that we kind of tried to skim over to prevent you guys from getting pre-lunch, post-lunch coma. Uh, thank you. <laughs>